Now I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mark Polat. Um, Dr. Polat is an associate professor in the Department of History of Art and Architecture. At DePaul since 1992, he teaches classes in American art, the history of photography, and modern art. Professor Polat has lectured and published widely on this topic. Two years ago, he appeared on C-SPAN, and an upcoming issue of Illinois Heritage is devoting its entire issue to his article on Lincoln and Hollywood film. A recipient of a teaching award, he has previously served as director of the first year program and as associate dean for the liberal studies program. Professor Polat's two children graduated from DePaul and did his partner. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Professor Polat. Oh, thank you so much, Harolyn. And I just want to thank um, Harolyn Kane um, for all her good work and her spirit and for um, her leadership in alumni relations. I also want to thank Emily Littlejohn, who's helping out. And then um, a special friend of mine, Josephine Chaparro uh, at Edgewater Village, who's been a real research uh, assistant for me and someone who loves Lincoln maybe more than anyone I know, although we all love, love Lincoln and especially at this time, don't we? Um, so my goodness, where to start? Um, maybe the snow, right? <laughs> or the political situation and, or, and how politics has drawn our attention back to Abraham Lincoln and his example. I wonder if you've watched the CNN special on Abraham Lincoln, A Country Divided. They just aired the first episode. I think that was um, maybe Sunday, Sunday night. Um, and I recognized a lot of the scholars on there um, as friends. And I wrote emails to each of them and said, you looked great, you did wonderfully. Um, but the snow, the snow is kind of interesting because I'm such a Lincoln nerd that I think of the so-called big snow of 1830, which happened when Lincoln's family had come from Indiana across the Wabash River by Vincennes and then landed up by Decatur. And they built a cabin for themselves, sowed a little corn, and then endured this incredible winter. It might've been the worst we weather in Illinois ever. And it was something like two full months of daily snow and sub-zero temperatures. And so Illinois pioneers, including Lincoln's family, would always talk about the big snow. And then after a time, it was like, well, are you a pioneer family? Do you remember the big snow of 1830? So uh, I was thinking about that. And then because I'm this old, I also think about the blizzards in 1976 and 1977. So very good. Let me let me uh, get started here. I'm going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint full of wonderful images of Lincoln in art, paintings, sculptures, prints, drawings, and in photography. And then one slide of Lincoln in film. And you know what? If there are films about Lincoln that you haven't seen, this would be a fantastic time to kind of catch up on those. You'll love them. There's some real classics. Okay, let me share and we'll get started. Okay, very good. Here we are, here I am. And there's, oh my goodness, one of my favorite Lincoln sculptures of all. And, and I wonder if you recognize this. Now, this is a, a real Chicago, this is a, a Chicago sculpture. It's right behind the Chicago History Museum and it's by St. Gaudens, Lincoln the Man or the Standing Lincoln. And it's fantastic, it's, it's superb. I just love it. And even art historians, people from around the country realize Chicago has one of the best sculptures of Lincoln, period. Okay. Okay, let's start with this one. This is a, a painting at the Chicago History Museum. We're not even sure what it, what it is for. We imagine it might've been for the presidential nomination of Lincoln who won the Republican uh, nomination in Chicago in 1860. And Lincoln didn't attend, although Lincoln did love Chicago. He came several times. And in fact, there was talk 
that he and Mary might retire to Chicago after their time in the White House, which is really interesting. They also talked about going to Israel, you know, the Holy Lands, um, going other places, but, but they both loved Chicago. Lincoln is a real presence in our town. Well, this is also the most skin that we're ever we're gonna see of any Lincoln portrait. This one is meant to show Lincoln as an athletic uh, man of the land. You know that Lincoln as rail splitter was concocted by Chicago politicians to give him an identity that rural voters could identify with. Because think of it, every, every person who owned land or worked land had to split rails to make fences. So it was a kind of a work that everybody was familiar with. It was hard, it was exhausting, and Lincoln was held up as a man of the people in, in, in that way. And by the way, look at what Lincoln is holding. That's not an ax, that's a maul, right? It pounds a wedge into the split logs that can then, the logs can be broken apart. And then if you look at the very background, very background, you can see the White House <laughs> on a hill. So apparently Lincoln is, is, is uh, splitting rails in Alexandria, Virginia, or uh, somewhere else. You, you can't see the White House from any river in, in Washington either, but it, it suggests his evolution to the White House, to the presidency. Leonard Volk was Chicago's first professional artist. Isn't that interesting? Leonard Volk, first professional artist. And he was married to Stephen Douglas's cousin. Stephen Douglas's cousin. Now you remember that Stephen Douglas was Lincoln's political nemesis in the, in the 1850, late 1850, mid to late 1850s. Douglas was the presidential one. No one doubted that Douglas would be president. Douglas was the one that owned so much land in what is now Bronzeville. Douglas helped found the University of Chicago. Douglas was an orator, had been a judge, a teacher, in every way superior to Lincoln. But Douglas made the, the bad decision of, of um, debating, wanting to debate Lincoln. And although Lincoln didn't win the Senate race, he put himself on the national stage. Well, Volk saw Lincoln coming to Chicago and Volk made Lincoln promise that Lincoln would come to his studio on Clark Street in the Loop. And so one day Lincoln was trying a case for the railroads and he had made a promise to Volk. He went up five flights of stairs, jumping up the steps. Volk said he could hear him bounding up the steps. And then Lincoln sat for these casts, which meant Volk put plaster on his face, and then uh, uh, straws in Lincoln's nostrils. And then Volk had to talk to him for 45 minutes while the plaster dried and they pulled it off. And then that produced a cast of Lincoln's face. Well, if you pour plaster into that mold, you can make this cast that we're looking at. And when Lincoln pulled it off, he pulled out his little hairs on the side of his head and he got all teary eyed and they laughed. Well, when Lincoln got the presidential nomination, Volk went down to Springfield. In fact, Volk said, I might have been the first person from Chicago to wish Lincoln good luck. And so Volk appeared at his house in Springfield that a lot of you have been to and asked Lincoln if he could cast his hands. And Lincoln said, well, hang on for a second. He ran out to the barn, sawed off a piece of a, of a broomstick handle, came back and said, oh, look what I got. I, I thought I should make it nice. He actually said that. And then they made casts of Lincoln's hands, probably in the kitchen. In uh, I wonder what Mary Todd Lincoln was, was thinking, probably yelling, what the hell are you guys doing? Making a big mess, what is that? Well, Volk then possessed the raw material to make statues like this. And in fact, Volk made a great deal of money in the, in the following years producing these beautiful busts, which are remarkably accurate because Volk had taken these casts, which are basically three-dimensional photographs of Lincoln's body, aren't they? And we're gonna see other sculptors use these casts too 
St. Gaudens used them for the statue in Chicago that we just saw. Okay, in terms of photography, Lincoln loved it. I don't think he ever turned down an opportunity to be photographed. He, he was older than photography. Photography wasn't invented until, well, it didn't come to America until about 1840. It didn't become really popular until about 1845. And then throughout the 50s and 60s, America became saturated in photographs. Um, so Lincoln couldn't have afforded it. It didn't exist. We don't have any photographs of Lincoln until that one on the left, right over here. Lincoln is 37. He is a family man, he has a beautiful home in downtown Springfield. He's a uh, well-established lawyer and far more put together than we ever thought. This photograph uh, was discovered in the 18, uh, early 18, mid 1880s and it surprised everybody. He's not the hayseed um, kind of bumbling, shambling man that we were led to believe. He's very put together, even, even kind of handsome. The photograph in the right is the way Lincoln looked at the time of the debates. And you can see <laughs> photographers had to use a, like a, a pole that was behind people that went around your neck. It was like a dentist's kind of in a dentist chair. It went around your neck. Lincoln is so tall that this photographer has had to put that stand on a stool behind Lincoln. And you can see the stool and you can see that his collar, which is always messed up in photographs, is kind of a little bit kind of popped up. And then on the right, my favorite photograph of Lincoln, we'll come back to this one. This was actually made for a sculptor, a woman sculptor who requested a close up of Lincoln's face. That's why we have this photograph, the most close up of any, any of the, the faces of Lincoln. And I just wanted to mention that, um, where are we here? Doris Kearns Goodwin, um, several years ago, she's a historian and wrote the book Team of Rivals, on which the Spielberg movie is partially based. Um, she actually said once in an interview, Lincoln was handsome. Lincoln was handsome. Why do we take for granted what Lincoln said of himself? Lincoln was constantly putting himself down. I look like an animal. I look ridiculous. I'm a big oaf. I'm a buffoon. Look at this face. Ha ha. It was a way that Lincoln broke the the ice with people, but it, it took someone to say, wait a minute, that's, that's not true. And then we find out that people of, of the time said he had a beautiful smile. And incidentally, we don't have any images of Lincoln showing his teeth or smiling. It wasn't appropriate. We weren't there yet with photography, but it's like, oh yeah. You know, people said he had beautiful eyes, which were by the way, steel blue or a beautiful laugh. They said he had a, a beautiful laugh, which is really interesting. We, we can't take Lincoln's word for it, right? That said, here's the first photograph of Lincoln in Chicago. A friend of his, while they were all in Chicago, asked Lincoln to stop on one of the, at one of the studios on Lake Street, because that was the great street in Chicago along the river at that time. It was only much later that State Street became the shopping district, but it was all, of course it was along the river. And that's where the photography studios were. So Alexander Hessler, a local photographer, um, made this photograph. It's become known as the tousled hair photograph because Lincoln's hair is really out of control. <laughs> there was a story that, that Hessler had it all nicely combed. And then at the last minute, Lincoln put his hands up and, and musted it up and said, my friends, down in the Sangamon would never recognize me if I if I had my hair looking like this. That's probably not true. It's probably just clean. You know, it's when you come to Chicago, you go to the barber and get a, get a shower bath, and it, it's just unruly. I've often thought he looks a little bit like Tom Cruise. He's a pretty handsome guy with a the perfect nose, and the, actually the hair is kind of stylish. Um, along those lines, did you know that Tom Hanks is related to? Abraham Lincoln, through his mother, Nancy Hanks. Tom Hanks is, oh, I think it's something like th third cousin, 10 times removed or something like that. But you can actually see 
Tom Hanks's face, and Tom Hanks is, is nowhere near as attractive as Abraham Lincoln, right? Tom Hanks still has that square, that square face um, that Lincoln had. Here's the print that was made of the tousled hair photograph. In those days, you couldn't publish a photograph. You had to have somebody draw a picture of the photograph, then make a print of the drawing, and then you could print off hundreds and thousands of these prints. This apparently was the print that rained down on delegates at the wigwam, which was a big building on Wacker at the river where the, the Republican nominating convention was held. And so this is the first picture that people saw. They, they probably took this home from the convention, uh, but it's based on Hassler's photograph and, and the, the hair is just so wonderfully wild and kind of silly. This photograph was taken by an 18 year old uh, who had a brand new studio in Beardstown. And in fact, this photograph was taken just minutes, an hour after one of Lincoln's most famous cases, the so-called Moonlight case, where Lincoln produced an almanac at the last minute to challenge the wit an eyewitness who said he had seen a murder committed by the light of the moon. And Lincoln said, well, that's interesting because I have my almanac right here. Let's see if the moon was out on that night. Oh, look, no, it wasn't. There was no moon. So, sir, I challenge you. How did you see, et cetera, et cetera. And Lincoln won in spectacular fashion. Um, by the way, when I tell this story in like Jacksonville, uh, which is closer to where the the crime took place. <laughs> People say, yeah, Lincoln used the wrong almanac. That's how shifty and, and, and uh, sneaky he was. He, he found an almanac um, that said, yeah, there was no moon on that day. Um, maybe, maybe. Um, what's interesting about this is Lincoln is almost smiling, super happy, uh, but you can also see the little side of the, let me do it on this side, side of the little, the little clamp that I was talking about that photographers used. And we're gonna see that suit a little bit later. That white linen duster appears in other photographs. Lincoln went to New York to give a very famous speech to demonstrate that a man from the wild west would could be a viable presidential uh, candidate for the Republican party. And he went to the Cooper Union, uh, which was, in uh, Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, and gave a speech. After the first few minutes, people got over his accent. Lincoln came alive. He stunned everybody with his intelligence and his wit, and it put to put forever. It put it to rest that he could be presidential. And this is the photograph that Matthew Brady made of him, which then was circulated. I have to say, it's been retouched in the face. Lincoln looks different in the face. Can you see that? His face looks squarer, handsomer. His hairline has been kind of changed a little bit. The, the rings under his eyes have been kind of taken out. Uh, but yeah, this became an, the Cooper Union photograph. Later, Lincoln said, Brady and the Cooper Union speech put me in the White House. And that's the thing about Lincoln and photography. How did he know that this new medium would be instrumental for politicians? That you gotta get your face out there if you wanna have a chance for people to A, recognize you and feel like they know you and then vote for you. How is that? How did uh, the son of a dirt farmer um, have a sense that we'd expect out of a Zuckerberg or a Musk or a Bill Gates, you know, about a new medium, but he did. So here's Brady with that clamp photographing Lincoln. He's actually counting off, sir, you know, stay still. Okay, almost there. Looks at his pocket watch and then replaces the lens cap. There's no shutters at this point. Here's Brady. The thing about him that's so interesting, almost legally blind. How did the greatest 19th century American photographer um, overcome that, his, his poor vision to capture the Civil War, the whole mid 19th century and Lincoln, et cetera? He, well, the answer was because he was an entrepreneurial genius. 
he knew that it wasn't just about giving people photographs of themselves. He knew that in his galleries, which is what we called, what they called a place where you go to have your picture taken, you had to soak people in pictures and not just photographs, prints, drawings, art, make people feel special that they are then now getting an image made of themselves, which will take take its place among famous entertainers and politicians and presidents, et cetera, et cetera. Oh my gosh, right away. You know, if anybody had asked me, hey, Polad, when do you think photographic political buttons appeared? I might've said, I don't know, Roosevelt, Eisenhower, Truman, maybe? Uh-uh, no. Photography is put to use for politics right away. And in fact, these are really expensive and rare. Little medals um, with little photographs inside them. And there's Hannibal Hamlin, um, who Lincoln met for the first, in, first time in Chicago, actually. They were both very tall. They both had lost a son at that point. Um, Hamlin was quiet from Maine. Um, I think Hamlin's Hamlin's son was named Lincoln. If that's if that, I think that's right. So yeah, that's it's a, it's they they got along famously. But then again, a lot of people got along famously with Lincoln. It might not have been that hard. So prints, drawings, um, media of all kind appear in newspapers and magazines, mostly to make fun of Lincoln. Like this one is brutal. Columbia on the left says, Mr. Lincoln, this is the height of the Civil War. Give me back my 500,000 sons. And look at the artist here, makes fun of Lincoln's bearing, the way he sits. He was thought to be sloppy and uncouth. Um, and then Lincoln scratches his head and says, well, that fact is, by the way, that reminds me of a story, which is something Lincoln was notorious for, always with inappropriate and badly timed stories. They were funny, but he was constantly joking and, and breaking the ice, putting people at ease. And look on the floor, Lincoln is calling for 500,000 more troops. Um, and so yeah, this is biting. This was from a newspaper in the North, actually. Here's one where Lincoln gets a little bit of a revenge when Lincoln stood for election the second time, a former general of his, McClellan, George McClellan, ran against him. And L McClellan was a, a short man um, and uh, known for digging in. He never really fought his beautiful army as much as he drilled them and groomed them, never really committed them to battle as much as Lincoln and others wanted him to. So he was shown with a shovel just digging in. And here Lincoln says, this reminds me of a little joke. And now <laughs> the little joke is McClellan. In the South, even during the Civil War, they didn't have things like paper, ink, artists, photographs. So the caricatures of Lincoln don't look great. Um, but sometimes they're effective, like here, another general, Lincoln gets a new toy and look at all the generals that haven't worked out for Lincoln on the shelf behind him. There's McClellan on the bottom, and Burnside, Banks, Fremont, McDowell. Now fighting Joe Hooker is gonna be Lincoln's man and he won't last either. Um, wait till the South gets a load of Ulysses S. Grant, right? Then, then it won't be so funny. Uh, but Lincoln went through so many generals um, for a lot of different reasons. All right, um, this man Carpenter lived in the White House for six months, photographing uh, furniture, photographing people, all to produce this great portrait the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation before the cabinet. Now, remember this was in uh, at the beginning of the, of the war, um, not four years later, but it, it took Carpenter all those years to produce this painting and he wanted to get it right. So every cabinet member gets a photograph and drawings and he meets with them, he takes measurements of the room. He wants this to be the moment when Lincoln read the emancipation to his cabinet. And it shows Seward, Lincoln's closest ally, on the opposite side of the table talking. And he's saying, sir, you probably need to wait until a decisive military victory, 
which would be Antietam, to do this. Otherwise, it'll look grasping and shallow. And Carpenter has arranged the people around Lincoln, the ones that were pro-emancipation, uh, Edward Stanton, uh, Minister of War uh, on the far left seating, Sam and Chase uh, above, Gideon Wells kind of in the middle there. He's the, the chief of the Navy. And then there's Blair, Bates, and someone else I, I'm not recalling right now. Um, and so it's deadly accurate. The th sad thing is it's not a great painting. You know, it's kind of muddy. Carpenter couldn't stop touching it up and he made it green and brown. And here's a little publicity at the time of Carpenter working on the painting <laughs> while apparently Lincoln and Mary look over his shoulder, no pressure, no pressure, it's just Lincoln watching you paint. <laughs> oh my goodness. And here's the print that resulted from the painting. Now this was what really mattered. As an artist, you got in touch with a publication company, a publishing house, they would produce a beautiful print of the painting because there's, the paintings are one of a kind. Carpenter always wanted the government to buy the painting, which eventually they did, and it's in a stairwell in the Capitol. Um, but the print is where all the money was made. Because think of it, they show the print to, to Lincoln for a subscription list. Lincoln says, okay, I'll take one for $100. Now everybody else in the cabinet's gonna have to buy one for $100. Everybody that knows these men or the generals, they'll buy one for 50. High-ranking politicians buy one for 25, average people buy one for 10, 15 dollars. That's where the money is made. In fact, Lincoln didn't live long enough to see this print and to get his, his version of it. But it's it's better, it's more vivid than the painting. A Chicago painter, um, George Healy, painted this of a meeting that took place at City Point in Virginia on the river, it says in a boat, the River Queen, and there's the Admiral Porter on the far right. The only time these three men got together, and it was basically to decide the fate of the end of the war. And Healy had painted each of them separately. And so he had photographs made of the interior of the, the River Queen, and then used those earlier artworks to put together this more or less realistic view of how the scene looked. And Sherman, on the far left who's talking, later said, this is exactly how it looked. This is precisely how it looked, even though Healy wasn't there. There's General Grant. Uh, and then people said Lincoln sat this way and he often made this gesture. He said when he sat with his legs crossed, his legs were so long, the, the opposite leg almost touched the ground. And then Lincoln was shown doing what he did best, listening, listening listening to experts, listening, gathering opinions, making up his own mind slowly. Um, and so this was a, a very accurate image of, of Lincoln. And, and then Healy made lots and lots of copies of this. Um, there's one at the Newberry Library in the lobby. By the way, before I leave this, you see the rainbow outside, which symbolizes a victory for the North uh, in just a, a few months after this, a couple of months after this. And the painting now exists in the White House. Um, that's Nancy Pelosi uh, on the right. And I don't know who that guy is on the left. <laughs> oh, Barack, love you, miss you. <laughs> so, but what, what a wonderful uh, setting. It's like, how could you not be inspired by, by uh, you know, these images of Lincoln, right? So, okay. How are you? Are you hanging in there? You guys are talking too much and it's slowing me up. So I can't, <laughs> I can't, I'm, I'm falling behind because I'm having such a good time. You're a, a wonderful audience. And I should say your grades are very good at this point. Very good at this point. Um, but I have to make some uh, big leaps and jumps here. I just did an article about this last two years ago now. This was the only photograph we had of Gettysburg, the dedication. Well, it's one of the only photographs. Uh, of Gettysburg, where Lincoln went to dedicate a cemetery. Um, he wasn't the main speaker. He was just asked to give a few appropriate remarks. So his, the speaker, Edward Everett, um, spoke for an hour and a half or two. 
And then Lincoln Rose spoke for 272 or three words. That's the Gettysburg Address. And we, we before the 1950s, we didn't have an image of Lincoln at Gettysburg, a photograph. One of my favorite archivists, a uh, librarian in Washington, found this photograph. It's broken. Um, it's on glass. And she said, you know, if I could blow this up, Lincoln has got to be in there. Lincoln has got to be in there. And in fact, she did that. And she blew it up and up and up. And she found Lincoln. Can you see him? He's in the upper center of the photograph. He's either standing up to give his talk or sitting back down. Photographers must have thought, well, hell, Ed Everett spoke for two hours. We have all the time in the world to set up, to snap the picture. Uh, but uh, this is the only image so far. There's, there's a contender out there that might show Lincoln on horseback uh, entering the battlefield, but this is definitely Lincoln. And in fact, if you look to the right, there's a man in a hat and a beard. But then to the right of him, there's a man with his arm on his, his shoulder, his, his waist, and his head is kind of looking around. And so it's blurred. That's Everett. He's just spoken. So this is probably Lincoln getting up, I would think, to speak. Um, but anyway, thanks to Josephine Cobb in Washington in the 1950s, we have this image. And the name of my article was The Woman Who Discovered Lincoln at Gettysburg. So thank God for her. All right. Other photographs like this one with Tad. And in fact, I got to tell you, we don't have uh, very many photographs of Lincoln with his family. This is about the only one. We have no photographs of Lincoln with Mary, which is really interesting. None. This one was made into um, all kinds of print media. And I, I don't know if you noticed, Tad has the same little watch chain as his dad, which is so sweet. Um, Lincoln called him that because when he was a little boy, Thomas uh, had a big head like a tadpole. And I'll just share you, I'll share this with you. I wanted to name my first son, Tad, um, uh, when he was, when he, just before he was born. And my wife reminded me that Tad Polad doesn't sound great. So we <laughs> we went with David. <laughs> so, but I just love Tad. He had a speech impediment. He, he, he like so many of the, the Lincolns, they were doomed. He died as a teenager, but Tad and his mother were living uh, in a house off Ashland Avenue here in Chicago. And Tad was going to a school about where the United Center is now. Uh, a lot of Kentucky families lived on Ashland, which is named for the, the plantation, more or less, of Henry Clay, a uh, Kentucky statesman who Lincoln rever revered. By the way, Lincoln said about this photograph, I don't want people thinking I'm looking at the Bible. This, uh, it, was just, it was just a uh, photographer's book. It was a, a sample book with photographs in it. It was a photography album. But Lincoln was very sensitive to that. Don't you, you know, he says that's kind of a species of false advertising, he said. And, and it's like, wow, how heads up are you to say a thing like that? You know, he's just very aware of media. When Lincoln was assassinated, print companies rushed to get the image out. No, no professor had ever been assassinated. And so firms like Courier and Ives, which usually took about a month to produce a print from start to finish, produced this one in 10 days. And people, people were appalled at this picture. It looks cartoonish to us today, but at the time it was like seeing photographs from Vietnam or the Iraq war or, um, Hor images of horrible violence. Now it's inaccurate in some ways, um, l like l l the size of John Wilkes Booth's head in relation to his body. Lincoln wasn't looking in that direction when he was shot. He wasn't grabbing the flag when he was shot. Major Rathbun couldn't have been standing when John Wilkes Booth fired the shot. Um, but but still, for for you know, 1865, April 1865, this was an incredibly um, dynamic image. And then there, of course, there was the public outcry. They wanted images of like, who was this? Remember, no president had ever been assassinated. Wait, 
Booth, Ed, Edwin Booth. No, 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 the other one. Like, wait, the young one? Like John Wilkes is the handsome one? He's like the kind of J James Dean, kind of a, you know, with a, it would be like the Baldwin brothers. Wait, which one? Like an actor killed the president? It was inconceivable. And so all kinds of imagery existed to kind of show <laughs> Booth being told by Satan where Lincoln was and putting the, writing the idea in John Wilkes Booth's mind. It's incredible imagery, but believe it or not, um, there was a hunger for Wilkes Booth imagery after the assassination, about as big as Lincoln's assassination. And I, I'm gonna go way out on a limb here and say, had Lincoln not been assassinated, the, the um, we, we may not have so many images of him. He wouldn't be the, the martyr. My, my goodness, he was shot on Good Friday. He was like the sacrificial lamb for the nation, nation's sins, right? It just, you couldn't have... I think Professor Poet froze for a second. Give us one minute and we'll see if we can get him back up and going. And just thanks everybody for joining and your patience. And please remember to um, submit any questions that you have through the chat feature below. And um, I'll be sure to ask Professor Poet when he gets back. All right. Did you did you lose me? <laughs> okay. it, was, it was it was getting really good too. So I'm gonna hop off and take <laughs> <wake up>. a <laughs> Okay. Is there a way for me to get on, or should we do the questions? Or oh, wait, you're if muted. You wanted, um, if you wanted to um, finish off where you left off, and then we can stop in a few minutes. A few questions came through the chat, and we can take those. Great. I will wrap up, and then you'll have to invite me back for a part two. Definitely. So, okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can get back. Okay. Great. All set? Yep. Good Great. to go. Uh, thanks. Let's, let's really try to finish up here. Oh, these are wonderful images. Um, this one broke my heart. A young girl from Wisconsin um, was asked to do images of sculptures of Lincoln. And this one is in Statuary Hall. So it broke my heart to see the rioters near it. And I was just holding my breath. Please don't touch Vinnie Reams, Vinnie Reams sculpture of Abraham Lincoln. And I'm just gonna go through something. There's our wonderful one. Here's, here's something we can end on. This is really touching. When this statue was dedicated in, the 18, in 1887, um, Lincoln's grandson, Abraham Lincoln II, was asked to unveil it. He was there on that rainy October day. He was uh, the closest living relative um, besides, uh, he, this was Robert Todd's son. And the reason I show you this grainy photograph of him is because to bring this full circle, this is probably what Abraham looked like when Abraham was a teenager. So when we say we don't have a photograph of Abraham, uh, when he was young, this is probably what Abraham looked like. And the reason that Jack here is in bed is because he's dying. He died when he was a teenager. He had a cyst removed from under his arm, got blood poisoning and passed away. Very, very sad. So let's go to the very end here. And then we'll take some questions. Um, this is worth a whole lecture on its own. And like I, I just was joking with Harold and I'm happy to come back and we'll take up these works that we haven't seen, uh, including some of the movies. 
But I just want to end with my favorite photograph of Lincoln. Um, there's so much we can say about the face, the, the lazy eye that, that um, wandered at times. And people wrote about this when they met him or the crooked nose that bends to the left um, or the mole or the fact, and this is, if you've never heard this, one side of Lincoln's face is actually smaller the right side of his face, his right side is smaller than the, the left side, which makes the nose curve, which makes the lip a little higher. Every artist knows you have to capture that. Also, Link, one side of Lincoln's body, the, the, his left side was higher. And so his tie would always be crooked this, in this direction. We don't think Lincoln had Marfan syndrome, which is a lengthening, that's Michael Phelps, right? A lengthening of ears and limbs. We think he had something like, let's see, what is it called? Uh, let's see, so, so, microsoma, facio microsoma. It's, it's literally when the engineering of your skull, facio microsoma is smaller on one side. And get this, one symptom, of this is depression. You can be clinically depressed. And we know that Lincoln suffered from not just bad moods. He wasn't just moody or, or you know, solitary. He struggled with depression throughout his life. So I love his face for what it can tell him. And then uh, let me show you this. This is not the face that Lincoln saw in the mirror every day. This is what Lincoln saw in the mirror every day which is a little jarring. If you are familiar with Lincoln's face to see what Lincoln saw of himself in the mirror, this is it. So his mole wasn't on the left side of his face, the mole was on the other side, that sort of thing. The part, everything else is different, but isn't this interesting? It just means we can talk so much about Lincoln's body, his face, what, what might've been wrong with him. Now, doctors think he might not have lived so much longer uh, after his assassination. Um, because of, of medical things that, that they think were wrong with him. Um, but oh, what a story, what an American, um, how badly we need his example these days. So thank you for listening. You guys got out of a quiz because I don't have the heart to do this. True, false quiz. Lincoln, Volk lived for a time with Lincoln in the White House, true or false? False, <laughs> right? A woman archivist first discovered Lincoln in the crowd. True. You thought you were out of college, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> Vinnie Weem sculpted a large Lincoln sculpture. Here I'm being a jerk. It's Vinnie Reem, R-E-A-M. Vinnie Reem. Okay, we didn't get to Mount Rushmore. That's going to be in part two. And then... There are three major Lincoln sculptures in or near Chicago's Loop. It's two. And um, one's in Lincoln Park, the one we saw, another in Grant Park that doesn't get visited enough. Okay, very good. You are the best. Oh, yeah. Here, wait, wait. Don't hand your quiz in yet. The last time DePaul won the basketball conference championship was in the 1980s. False. Women basketball, women's basketball team won last year in 2020. We won the whole conference. Um, we always have to remind ourselves we have very successful sports teams here in, at DePaul. Okay, very good. If you want to call me or email me after we're all done here today, please do. This is a wonderful time to have a conversation about Lincoln. And I would love, I'd love to talk about Abe in any way you'd like. So great. That's it. Thank you so, so much, Professor Paulette. And I did not do too bad on that pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back in school again. Um, and we had um, a few questions pop up. Um, a couple of people brought up the um, clamps. Can you explain why the photographers used a clamp for portraits? Oh, that's the brilliant question. The clamp wasn't so much to hold you still. So that's, these are the days when it takes, oh, maybe 45 seconds, 30 to 45 to a minute. 
you had to stay still. That That's absolutely right. You could blink. I've heard people say like you weren't allowed to blink in tears. Or you could blink because the camera wasn't fast enough to pick up your closed eyes. The clamp was mostly so that the photographer knew that you'd be in focus. If you had your head in the clamp, they knew you were the perfect distance from the camera. So it wasn't just to hold you in place, it was for the focus. But that's a great question. Um, um, what are your thoughts on Lincoln and stereographs? Um, yeah, that's great. Stereographs are those long cards that show an almost identical photograph. If you look at the card through a viewer, it makes the object, whatever's photograph, look three dimensional. Um, that was big business. People produced those of Lincoln statues, Lincoln portraits, things like that. I did a, um, I was working on a project to find out if Lincoln ever, ever um, looked through the viewer and looked at them. And there is evidence that he did. And in fact, he probably looked at landscapes in California to, to bring legislation to make the first national park, what would be the first national park um, in California, Yosemite, uh, would be the Mariposa Pines region. And there's evidence that he was looking at photographs. He never went to California, of course, just to, to see the landscape. And I've often thought maybe he, the three-dimensional quality made him think that it was so beautiful that it was worth saving. But that's a really good question. That's, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, did Lincoln ever take photographs or draw himself? Oh, very good. He was he was fascinated with cameras and guns and contraptions. You know, as an inventor, he had a couple of things uh, patented. Uh, and so he loved learning the way things worked, but he didn't photograph as far as we know. There's a story that um, Mary Todd Lincoln was had an apron full of family photographs that she was going to throw away. And Abraham stopped her and said, hey, what are you doing? I think people are going to want to see those one day. Um, and so those photographs passed to Robert Todd, who then gave them out to various people. But, but Lincoln had some idea. Uh, but in terms of art, he, he thought he was a pretty, he said, I don't know why I don't like fine things. I don't have a taste. He was being too hard on himself. But there is a theory that he was colorblind. And so if that's true, maybe he thought for that reason, he wasn't all that artistic or creative. So, but yeah, excellent. Um, what was the name of the Lincoln TV series you mentioned and where can it be viewed? Um, I saw it on, uh, did I see it on Netflix? CNN produced a, a a program called Divided, we Abraham Lincoln, quote, a country divided or a country divided, colon, Abraham Lincoln. And it, as far as I know, only one episode has aired. So you can see that if you just look CNN, Lincoln, country divided or whatever. But yeah, it's about an hour. So it's wonderful. Um, I know you were um, asking people earlier about um, assassinations. Uh, someone just made a comment and said that although no other presidents were assassinated, there was an attempt on Andrew Jackson when he was president. Quite right. No, very good. And I should say, Lincoln took his bodyguards seriously. And he, he knew, can you imagine, you know, before you even get to Washington, like Lincoln did, he, there were threats on his life, just getting to Washington. Um, he had to have bodyguards, the Pinkerton, Alan Pinkerton, who would start a detective agency, the Pinkertons, uh, and his men guarded Lincoln. And Lincoln, Lincoln took it seriously. In fact, Lincoln had his hat shot at uh, on, a, on a trip uh, outside of Washington. But you're right, there was an attempt on Andrew Jackson's life, which, oh man, Andrew Jackson was such a bad boy. <laughs> that, that took some nerve, right? Um, but yeah, absolutely right. Um, someone said they missed the part. Can you repeat the significance of the stool? The stool. Um, I think maybe in one of the pictures. Let's see. Oh, yes. That was a, a, a photograph showing Lincoln standing. 
And this immobilizer we were just talking about stood on a stand behind the person, but Lincoln was so tall that stand wasn't even high enough to reach the back of his neck. So this, the whole stand had to be raised on a stool. And that's the thing about photographs of Lincoln. You can often see something of the camera or the apparatus or the way the photograph was made inside the photograph. So yeah, he was very tall. By the way, Mary Todd was about five foot three or four. So she wasn't grotesque next to him. You know, he was about six foot three when he was standing. And then if he stood up really straight, six foot four. Um, but they didn't, they were made a pretty decent couple, by the way, even though Lincoln would joke about, about it. But yeah, so his height was fascinating at a time when the, the average height for a man was about five, two, three, four. So, I mean, he did look grotesquely tall for his time. Until you um, mentioned in one of those pictures where his um, legs were crossed, I really noticed. And you said the <laughs> other one like was almost down. It was absolutely. Noticeable. Yeah, I love talking about Lincoln's body. I know that sounds creepy, but you know when he was shot, they laid him in bed and took off his shirt, and there was a gasp because he was so buff. He, he was so wiry and, and, and uh, toned. I mean, my God, he was only, what, 50, 54, something like that, 50, no, 56. And so he still had those, those arms from all that work he had done as a young man, so. Um, someone wanted to know if you are familiar with the sculpture of Lincoln and stages of his life in Lockport by the Public Landing Restaurant? Um, I don't know that sculpture, um, it, uh, if it shows the stages of his life, but I'll go uh, online right after our talk and take a look at it. There are so many good, so many good statues of Lincoln um, in the last 10 or 15 years as we pass the bicentennial of his birth. So here, this is just John McClary. I don't know if, if you can see these sculptures but it's just one man who has produced so many sculptures of, of Lincoln as a surveyor, as a lawyer, a debater. There was one where Lincoln made a joke in court because a, a, a pig was being really noisy underneath the floorboards of the courthouse, but there are so many new sculptures and, and many of them are good. Um, if I could just say my favorite sculpture of Lincoln in Chicago is at Lawrence and um, Western Avenues in the Lincoln Square neighborhood. That one should be downtown. That one should be in the loop. Um, I'm sorry if you live in that neighborhood, but that one is so good. It's Lincoln as he would have been, as he would have been seen coming to Chicago without a beard, a young lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. So, but thank you, I'll look. I wonder if that's, someone asked, I don't know if that's the same statue they said, um, where is the statue of young Lincoln now that used to be um, in the Chicago library, which became the cultural center? Let's see, the young Lincoln. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. I, could, it, could it be that one? Make um, it sound like it. That's why I said it might be once yeah. you brought it up and I read the question. That's a that's a really good that's a really good question. I, if you follow up with me, we'll track it down and we'll talk about it with a photograph. Or I'll tell you what I'll bring it to the next lecture if we do another one on Lincoln, and we'll we'll start with that. And we don't have so many uh, sculptures of Lincoln as a young man, mm -hmm. so that'd be fantastic. Um, and do you know if there are any? Um, someone wanted to know how many death and live masks still exist. Great question. I'm actually writing a book about those Volk life masks and the hand cast. Those have never stopped being reproduced. So there's a couple of very early ones in the Chicago History Museum and in the Smithsonian um, in Washington. And then I think in the Glessner House, there's one of the original bronze ones. Um, but you can buy these on eBay. You can buy them on Amazon. They just have never stopped being reproduced. They're pretty cool, actually. And if you have a lawyer in your family, that's a great gift. Or, or for any Lincoln lover, uh, that's a pretty great gift. Um, they're much cheaper than you'd imagine. Um, but so, yeah. Um, and while you have this up, someone wanted to know if you can put up the slide with the movie posters. Yes, thank you. Um, 
I, the, the older ones are at the top. The Spielberg Lincoln is the one on the left. The one in the bottom center, you may not have seen. It's, it's a very low budget movie and they used historic photographs for the background. So they shot the whole thing on green screen and then put these historic photographs in the back. It kind of works. I'm not gonna lie. It's a lot better than you think. And then the one to the right, the better angels is Lincoln as a boy in Indiana. It's a little, it's, it's in black and white. It's very elegant, very arty. Um, some people have said it's a little slow, but it, 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 the production is so good. It, it looks exactly like what it must have looked like in wilderness, Indiana. Um, it's very sweet, very sad, um, and very beautiful too. Okay, well, I see um, we're running out of time here. I just wanted to thank you once again. And there were a lot of comments and everyone was saying, thank you, this was amazing. Thank you. Um, and I just really appreciate you um, doing this and everyone else today. So um, thanks again. Thanks to everybody, thank absolutely. You.